Right about 20 years ago, Brad and I were walked into a doctor's office with our parents. The doctor sat us down and said, you have Stargardt's disease. It's a juvenile form of macular degeneration. He turned to our parents, he said, what that means is you have tr your sons have trouble metabolizing vitamin A. That's gonna create scar tissues. Ultimately, they're gonna end up with a giant blind spot in the center of their vision. And then he told us to go home, learn to read braille, get a magnifying glass, and prepare to go blind. Well, it's been 20 years since that day, and this story ends a little bit differently than you would imagine. Check it out. We are two blind brothers. Brian and I have an eye condition called Stargardt's disease. An eye disease that causes blindness over time. We lose our center vision and we keep a lot of our periphery. The only thing that is predictable is that it gets a little worse over time. Visual impairment never was going to be an excuse in our lives, that it was never going to dictate our lives. Last year, they launched a clothing line where 100% of the profits goes towards finding a cure. When you lose a sense like your eyesight, you start getting more information from some of your other senses. When I think of fashion, I think of line, style, color. What am I missing? Touch. As soon as you put this shirt on, you can understand the, the love and passion that went into this project. Uh, earlier this year, we ran into the Dallas Lighthouse for the Blind. They employ 70% visually impaired workers to do all of the cut and sew manufacturing. What's great about it is the clothing is soft, it is great, and all of the money is going towards finding a cure. We're literally about to see people who were given a diagnosis of blindness who will now be able to be treated and regain eyesight. Vision impairment has given more to us then it's taken away. Anybody want a shirt? Your greatest challenge is your greatest gift. Thank you. So that video makes us look a lot cooler than we actually are. Um, and in the spirit of truth, we want to take you back a little bit, Quentin Tarantino style. We want to go back to the very beginning. And that is when I was in first grade. And I was standing on my first day about two feet from the chalkboard because I had promised my mother that morning that if I couldn't see what was on the board, I would get up out of my seat to go see it. And as I turned around in that moment, I felt all the eyes of the class on me, and I remember feeling a little bit different. And then later, at lunch, this little jerk in the class comes up to me and says, can you see? And I defensively said, yes. And then he said, well, how many fingers am I holding up? And I actually couldn't see it, and I felt ashamed, I felt embarrassed, I felt sad that I didn't have the same vision as the people in our class had. As a total side note, after living with that question for 25 years, everyone always holds up two <laughs> fingers. I, I, it's really weird, but it's actually an easy question to answer. <laughs> and when I got to high school, I was going to be a rebel with a really blurry cause. I was going to sit in the back of the classroom. I wasn't going to be able to see the board, but for that day, I didn't want to be the blind kid. And so my teacher, Dr. Folo, calls on me. He goes, Brian, can you please do this problem? And trust me, I've been blind for years now, so I had a bunch of strategies to basically get him to tell me what I needed to see. And the first one, always ambiguity. Dr. Folo, what problem are we talking about up there? And he just says, this one. Uh, again, no worries. Dr. Folo, what numbers are we talking about up there? A lot of things. And he just says, these. And well, th you know, then at the second point, it was go to strategy two, play dumb. Because at that point in my life, being dumb was way better than being blind. Dr. Folo, I apologize. I just don't know how to do it. He looks back at me and goes, what are you talking about? It's simple division. And my third strategy I should have enacted about 90 seconds earlier where you kindly get up and excuse yourself to the bathroom before anybody can ever call on you. <laughs> Spent a lot of time in there. Um, but on that day, none of my strategies had worked. When, as my head slowly fell to my desk, I do admit to Dr. Folo, 
to my class and to myself that I couldn't do the problem because I couldn't see it. But then you realize that being visually impaired is always going to be true. And all these little strategies I'd had to trick people was what was truly holding me back. I could not be successful in my life unless I embraced visual impairment and understood the gifts that it was giving me and then used them to be successful. And so with those mindsets and a few skills we learned along the way, we were lucky to have good academic careers and we were able to get good jobs after school. And then about three years ago, Brian and I were both in New York City walking around downtown doing some shopping. And we were really excited talking about this guy. This is a kid named Yannick Duet, and he was born with a disease called Labor's Congenital Amaurosis. It's a long word, but what it really means is that he was going blind as a young child. And he grew up reading Braille, and then he was treated with a gene therapy that restored his eyesight. He went from reading Braille to reading text, and it was a miracle. And we were really fascinated by it. When we looked into it, we saw that actually that therapy started with a small charitable gift to a researcher that was looking for the gene back in 1994. And when we looked further, we saw there are actually hundreds of researchers working on these fascinating scientific advancements and treatments all they needed was that same little extra help, that same charitable gift. And on this day, Brian and I were shopping at Bloomingdale's, and one thing about being blind or visually impaired, it's pretty easy to lose people, so I had lost my brother in the store. And another thing about being blind or visually impaired is shopping is actually a big pain. You can't see the prices, the colors, the size labels that well. So we always just start with feeling the item. We run around like we're five years old and touch everything. And then when you find something you like, you do all the extra work to try and figure out if you want it. So on this day, we walk out of the store and coincidentally, we had bought the same exact shirt. And uh, he doesn't want to look like me. I don't want to look like him. So <laughs> we played rock, paper, scissors. I won, he lost. I always throw rock. He hadn't figured it out at that point. 27 uh, years. <laughs> Just. Uh, but in that moment, a kind of a light bulb went off for us. We thought, what if this could be our project to help give back to these researchers? What if we started a clothing label with two simple ideas? One, create the softest clothes we possibly could with that vigilance and detail to sense of touch. And two, donate all of the profits from that project back to these preclinical researchers that are trying to find a cure for blindness. And that's when we started our clothing label, Two Blind Brothers. Thank you. Thank you. And we are finally back to the present. And that video we showed you at the beginning gets you pretty much up to date, minus 100% of the fighting. That is a different <laughs> video. Uh, we show at different <laughs> events. Well, we've been running Two Blind Brothers now for a little over two years. And we've realized something very, very special. We are a personal brand masquerading as a clothing company, like every consumer product in the world. And when you are a brand, the single most important things are getting people's trust and having their attention. And the best way we've found to do that is through storytelling and doing genuine good. Our mission page on Two Blind Brothers, when we first started, said the following. We give 100% of our profits to preclinical retinal research. We partner with organizations like the Foundation for Fighting Blindness and the Gund Harrington Fund to find early stage researchers who need a little bit of money to conceptualize their idea, to get it to a clinical trial, to get outside capital, to give an uh, investment, to get it to a, trust me, it goes on for about 45 minutes. And as you could imagine, People didn't care. They had a million questions. Why do you partner with this foundation? Why do you focus on these researchers? Have you looked at this? Everybody had a question, but nobody wanted to help. And then we changed our mission page to what it is today. About two seven-year-old boys who were walked into a doctor's office 
told they're going blind, and then told to go home. And that's it. And now our mission, and that, and our mission now is to change go home to there's hope. And here are the clinical trials that will do that. And when we realize the power of storytelling, the magic of storytelling, is when a gentleman reaches out to us and says, I know nothing at all about preclinical retinal research. Who does? But I have a feeling that you guys are going to be the best stewards of this money. How can I help you? What can I do to get involved? In that story was really powerful for us. <laughs> but another thing, another story we had recently that was unbelievably successful was during the week of Black Friday, we launched a campaign called the Shop Blind Experience. And we ex made a video explaining the following message. If you're blind or visually impaired, you trust people a lot. You have to trust the waiter to give you a good recommendation on a menu you can't see. You trust the sales associate to find that item in the store you're looking for. You trust the Uber to drop you off on the right corner. And we wanted to give the visitors to our Two Blind Brothers website the chance to trust us. So we blacked out the entire experience. And people were asked if they wanted to buy a product that they couldn't see and could get no details on. <laughs> And, you're, and everyone's laughing, but it was, it, it was amazing. And the reason is because of storytelling. Context is everything. Facts these days are very fragile. You can almost claim anything you want about yourself. Brian and I could claim that we are the biggest speakers at TomTom, Tom, <laughs> but you don't, may not realize that that's just because if you combine both of our weights, we weigh more than Dan Rather. <laughs> so we're literally the heaviest people giving a speech. And I'm sure you're out there thinking right now, all right, I believe it. Stories are fantastic, but I don't have a story. I am not a kid who was diagnosed with a degenerative eye disease, with a brother with suspicious amounts of gray hair for his age. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> uh, but I'm here to tell you, you absolutely do. And to prove it, I want to do something with everybody. I'm the, well, I'm going to count to three. And when I get to three, I want all of you to pick the person to your left or to your right, and I want you to blow them the most passionate kiss you ever have in your entire <laughs> life. One, two, well, here it comes, get ready, three, go. <laughs> now, <laughs> I can't believe they did it. Uh, <laughs> just, just by mathematics, not all of you could have gotten one, so that's to you. But what, what did we just do? That was a little bit of an embarrassing moment. It was a little bit of a funny moment because no other speaker has ever asked you to do something like that. Even a stranger on the street probably hasn't. But you now have a story from this speech. You are an active participant in this speech. And when you go to tell somebody about this later, you can say, actually, it was so funny. I got to blow a kiss. I ended up getting the, guy, the girl's number, and we ended up going a date. We got married three <laughs> years later. We have four kids. We have a beautiful life. Thank you, Brian. But, <laughs> but when you're a brand and when you're selling a consumer product, your story has to be your why. It is the most singularly important thing. And when you're a personal brand, your entire life is a why. Hi. Uh, your entire life is a why. And then it's all about the perspective you take on it. But the one piece of advice I will give you, the more personal, the more authentic that story is to you, the more universal it will be for everybody else because we all have essentially the same desires. And the second thing that we do that I think has allowed us to be a lot more successful than we expected is our attitude towards doing for others and doing good for other people. Not only is it the right thing to do, but it's an incredibly powerful business tool. Right now we live in an age where everything is overexposed. You can have one angry employee, junior staffer, coworker, friend, ex-lover who texts, who tweets something out about you, and it could end up on the front page of the New York Times. But beyond that, the person who gives the most is the person who creates the most leverage 
for themselves. When Brian and I create content for our community at Two Blind Brothers, we don't talk about our product. We focus on what is most valuable to that viewer or customer. It might be something about vision impairment, it might be something about starting a cause-driven brand, it might just be entertaining. And the hope is that if somebody sees that piece of content, they'll think, oh, that's valuable. But what we're really going for is if they see not just one thing, but five things, 10 things, 100 things from us that have that intention, they'll stop saying that's valuable and they'll start saying they are valuable. And three weeks ago, we got on the phone with a mother for 45 minutes. Her daughter, who was nine, had just gotten diagnosed with Stargardt's disease. And we chatted around all of the hard times, the frustrations, but the amazing things that can come out of that hardship, the self-esteem and the empowerment. And at the end of that 45 minutes, she felt better. She felt like it, what her world had stopped shaking quite as heavily. And when she is looking for a gift for her brother or her husband or her daughter, or when she's talking about her daughter's diagnosis, what company is going to come to mind? Coca-Cola, Under Armour, Zara, or the two guys who talked to her for 45 minutes when she was terrified? General Patton once said, the most impossible places are usually the least guarded. And big companies right now are so focused on optimization and efficiency that they've forgotten about small towns where people want to know the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker. <laughs> Every single one of us do. We want to know our brands. And that's why doing good isn't just a sales tactic. It's the way that a small brand can compete with anyone because good, doing good is good business. And so why are we you know, on this stage? Well, if we're taking our own advice, it's to try to garner your trust and your attention. And to do that, we try to tell a good story and we try to deliver something that's valuable. But beyond that, we feel so incredibly lucky to be able to build this project and have the impact on our mission. But if one person can take a lesson from watching what has happened for us with Two Blind Brothers, and they can use that in their charity, their passion project, or their business, we're actually getting a multiple on the effect of the social impact that we never dreamed that we would have. So on that note, embrace grit, embrace hardship in your weaknesses, tell a great story, do great things for other people, and if that's not enough, you can actually reach out to Brian and I personally at brian at twoblindbrothers.com and bradford at twoblindbrothers.com. Thank you, Thank Tom you. Tom.